Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Beyond Seven Figures podcast. Now, if you are driving in your car, you're going to want to listen to this episode again. If you are sitting at your computer or near a desk, I'm going to encourage you to grab a pen and a paper. I say that because our guest today has a whole wide breadth of experience and knowledge. Somebody I've been really looking forward to interviewing now for a number of different weeks. His name is Raymond Ray. Uh, Raymond has started four companies and he's sold two of them. He's a very successful entrepreneur, as you'll soon see. He's in, de in demand motivational speaker and event host and so forth. He's authored four books, including Celebrity CEO and uh, Audiences Around the World. They're just so inspired by his energy and so forth, which uh, I think his energy right in and of itself before we started this podcast it was infectious. I couldn't get the smile off my face. It just felt great. But look, let, let's let's talk about some of the things that he's done, just so you understand why I, I feel blessed to have this guy on today's show. Uh, you know, he's been invited to the White House. He's testified to the U.S. Congress. Uh, he shared the stage with celebrity business thought leaders like uh, Seth Godin and Simon Sinek and Gary Vaynerchuk, etc. He's a founder of SmartHustle.com. Many of you might already know about that website, but SmartHustle.com. Uh, this is interesting. He's actually been fired from the United Nations, so we'll have to dive into that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> maybe a badge of honor there. Who knows? Uh, he's interviewed the President of the United States. Uh, grad, he's a graduate of the FBI Citizens Academy. Uh, interviewed all five Shark Tanks. Look, I could keep going on and on and on, but at the end of the day, let's tap into the, the brain power of my friend Raymond Ray. So welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, Charles, thank you so much. It's good to be here, man. And thanks for having me on. And thank you for those kind words. It's hard to sit back and hear about yourself. <laughs> but I know it's important to, to introduce a guest. So I was quiet as much as I could. But thank you for having me. And just kudos to you. I'll just repeat what I told you before we uh, recorded this, that really I followed you. And those, those who are listening, if it's your show, but I'm like ask, interviewing you. But please do repeat what I'm talking about if, if, if it's still available. But I think you have a series of emails about sales or more, which is just fabulous. And that's how I got hooked on you. And I can't remember how I heard your name first. I don't know if it was Lauren Feldman, 21 Hats, or somebody else in the middle, but your name popped up somewhere and I've been hooked on your uh, advice ever since. So thank you for having me, but right back at you, the brilliance you provide to so many of us as well. Well, together we're better, right? So, uh, so I, I do a, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Look, I, there's so much I want to ask you, um, but I have to start with this one. How'd you get fired from the United Nations? Yeah, I got What's fired. The story there. <laughs> Trying to build a business, but the, the short of it is, I had a great. Uh, I, I'm glad I was at the UN. I learned quite a bit over the many years I was there. One of my first professional jobs you know, kind of right out of uh, high school. I started there when I was 20-ish, give or take. I've done a lot of things young, married young, uh, got my first real job young. And I shouldn't say real job because I've had jobs packing groceries at a grocery store. That is a real job. But you know, where you put a, a tie on and other things. Um, but I got fired there. The nutshell is the UN has strict rules like any kind of government entity uh, against having side employment, uh, including your own business or not, unless you have permission, Charles. So I had permission to do that by a great boss at the time. But then, you know, Charles, you run into those jealous people. It's like, say you have permission to chew gum in church. Just you, Charles, you can chew gum in church. But then somebody's like, why is he chewing gum and we can't? <laughs> so that <laughs> opened up the whole can of worms to then the permission being revoked. What am I going to do? I had a thriving either one or two business at the time. Can't remember what I was doing when I was working there. And I kept doing it eventually. My contract was not renewed or in normal person speak, fired. And that was that. But it was a good run. I, I was blessed to have been there, learned quite a bit. But that's how you get fired from the UN, either doing something really egregious, like stealing millions of dollars of oil or guns or ammunition or something. <laughs> I didn't go that route. I just kept doing what I'm doing. I, I, I knew where the, where, the, where the road was leading. But I, you know, I kept doing it. Eventually, Ramon, thank you for your service. Goodbye. That was the <laughs> essence of it. <laughs> So, I mean, how do you, you've accomplished a lot. You've, between interviewing the five Shark Tanks and interviewing a president sure. and sharing the stage with a whole bunch of, you know, great business leaders and, and so forth. How did you even get those opportunities? Yeah, 
I think what I'll answer it this way, and you let me know if it answers it, because I think I'll answer the, the not end of the journey, but where I see myself and am today. I think, and you work with companies like this a lot, I think that we can keep our head down, and I say it in a good way, and do everything perfect and right and building our businesses, seven, eight, whatever the figures may be, building our businesses. I think that the principle of that is good, but I've been more, so let me just take things as they come. I'm just going to be a freewheeling, oh, this didn't work. Okay, shut it down and fail in this. Uh, this doesn't work. And just take the opportunity as they come, if that makes sense. So the fundamentals are the same. Things you teach, got to have a good team, got to scale, right? Jim Collins, flywheel, all those kind of things. Yeah. I have that, you know, learned it over the years. But I think I've done all that because I have been kind of just when you're out there, Charles, and that's part of the one thing, those struggling with social media, I think I'll probably give a lot of that, even though I've built, you know, I've done this before social, that's helped a lot. I think the, the podcast, the, the videos, I've probably done what seems like 75 videos, uh, and it's only four hours since, or five hours since I've been up. So, <laughs> you know, all that of just not quite throwing spaghetti against a wall, because I don't want people to think that it's, there's not a strategy to it. And you can probably help me say better what I'm trying to say, but it seems like just throwing stuff up in the air. And that's how it happened. I'll give you just a, a small example, like Congress. Part of my experimenting, I'm like, oh, let me interview some Congress people. I, it boosts my brand. It'd be cool to do. I couldn't get it at the time. They said no or something. I called the office of the, the head of the small business of the House of Representatives. Shabbat, I believe his name is. I think he's still around. He's the US Congress person. Point being, they're like, no. I got a call literally a few hours later, something like, you know what? Somebody couldn't show up at a committee hearing since they kind of did look me up, but they couldn't, they couldn't accommodate me. They're like, but could you testify to Congress? I'm like, ha, huh, I can't interview you, but you want me to testify to Congress? Let's do it. <laughs> so metaphorically, Charles, that's been my career, just either making my own opportunity or watching for opportunity or raising my hand to say, hey, Charles needs somebody to paint his studio. He said, like, you know, I, you know what I mean? I'll yeah. do that. But then while I'm painting Charles' studio, I didn't know that he was having some big, big celebrity inside and we three ended up having dinner together. Is that helpful, Charles? Yeah, you know, it, it is. It's, you know, I was actually having a conversation last week and somebody made a comment and they said, um, oh, well, see, you're different. You're lucky. I'm not lucky. I said, what do you mean? And they go, well, I mean, the thing is, is let's face it. Some people have all the luck and some people don't. I said, what? I'm curious. What makes you think that I'm lucky? And so she sat and she started talking about, well, you have this, you did this, you did that, you did that. I go, interesting. Did you know that at some point in my life, I was in over $200,000 of credit card debt? Were you aware that at one point I was almost homeless? Uh, that, you know, this happened and that happened and that happened? Well, I mean, I, I didn't know that. And I'm like, right, I kept going. It reminds me of uh, a quote, I think Mike Tyson said it, uh, something along the lines of, you know, being punched in the face and then standing back up again, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, people look at everything that you've accomplished because that's what most people kind of put out on the surface without looking at all the struggle and, and stuff in the back. But here's what I found. And Raymond, I'd be interested to see if, if you feel the same way, mm -hmm. those people who have had the most quote unquote luck or the most success also came from or created or at one point experienced the most struggle, hardship, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So it's funny just today, again, I'm not sure when people are going to hear this, but just today as we're recording this, I um, put that on LinkedIn. I said, sometimes if you, if somebody who hasn't gone through struggle, not that I'm going to ding them or mark them off automatically, but you're right. And I think that that makes us strong. It, there's something about it. I'm sure there's some smart person from Harvard or some community college who studied this, but I think you're right. You look at many people who've had whatever level of success, we're all equal. We all pee the same and all that, but you know, some <laughs> level of monetary success is usually a measure of it, or just you're blessed that you can kind of relax a bit, right? And, and do things yeah. you really want to do, helping others. You're right. They've usually been in dead, homeless, divorced, almost dead, got their arms cut off, something happened to them, right. and, you know, and they got smacked in the face with that. So yes, you're so true on that. And I think that uh, many people's path has not been easy, but I think we learn from it. And I, and I, I guess, Charles, I was talking to a nonprofit organization, a big name organization that we all know of about two or three days ago. 
And they were asking me, do small business owners need more tools, need more resources? They wanted to create some information center. And I said, probably not. Google's the index to you, Charles, to me, anybody, right? Marie Forleo talks about everything is figure outable. It's all there. Yeah. But the difference is the mindset and how to, and I started crying as I was telling them because I have a community of people that I mentor as well. And I was like, that's my biggest struggle. I don't need to tell them how to build a one page website. They, that's there. That's easy. People like Ramon, what's the favorite podcast host, you know, way to host your podcast. You can figure that out. Yeah. But it's your mind. That's the toughest part. You know how many guests that we have here on the Beyond Seven Figures podcast that have huge successful backgrounds and we dive deep into the strategy and you know our listeners are always leaning in waiting for what is the big you know secret the big reveal and whatnot and the the business owner goes into the mindset as the most powerful you know feature attribute and whatnot i mean i can tell you myself i've spent over a half a million dollars between my wife and i traveling mm-hmm. the world studying from some of the the greatest thought leaders, billionaires, centimillionaires, and so forth. And so much of that came down to mindset and getting the mind right. 2020, you know, when when crap hit the fan, you know, first thing that we had to do with our clients is ask them, why is now the best time in the world for you to be in business? You know, and some of our clients looked at us like, yeah, we've been following you for a long time, but I'm starting to think you smoke the wacky tobacco. You know what's really kind of going on here, right? Um, but it, it, it really does come, come down um, to that mindset is, is a big thing. And it's, I wish I could say that that's something that, you know, is, is brand new and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the Chinese figured that out thousands of years ago with the yin yang, yes. that every negative has an equal and opposite positive. Yes. Every yes. observable molecule all the way down to the smallest, smallest little thing has both a positive and negative energy. Today's rainforests were yesterday's deserts and economies that go up eventually go down and down economies. Uh, and so there's, there's this balance always. And yes. so, you know, I, I did learn that, that when I went through struggle after a while, I realized that, wait a minute, <clears throat> why could this be the best thing that's ever happened to me? Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Tony Robbins, I, I spent quite a bit of time with Tony and traveling the world with him. And uh, one of the questions that he asked me was, you know, what's my biggest problem? And, you know, I went into what I thought was a problem and he looked at me and he said, is that really a big problem or a little problem? And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, you know, big people have big problems. Little people have little problems. You can tell the size of the person by the size of the problems. And he said, see, little people will run away from their problems. Big people will create big problems for themselves. Yeah. You know, Elon Musk is call- trying to colonize Mars, you know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. But like the Dalai Lama is trying to bring peace. Mother yes. Teresa tried to feed nations. So it's not even just about money. It's about, you know, they're creating problems yes, for themselves. Yes, yes. And can I add one more thing to that that aspect? Yeah, I think please. We talk about mindset a lot, Charles. And I think what's, what's interesting about this is, and it, it's a cousin to mindset because I think the tools and tactics are important. Can't ignore that. But I find that there's a second part, I think, to success is that um, how do you leverage opportunity so meaning the mindset i'm going to have grit but kind of like the person who's you know business development type they can they can leverage an opportunity if you know what i'm trying to say they can say okay the person said i can't have soda huh let me see if they want juice i don't know if that silly yeah, example yeah, makes yeah. sense because that i think is the other part of it that 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 god bless me to do well is that uh, example hillary clinton uh, again, forget politics here now. I've been with Trump and, and, and Obama and all those, so I want to respect. I, I was at an event one day, Charles, and I put it in President Obama's face. Half the room wanted to like <laughs> kill me. So thankfully, I was with Ivanka Trump in India. Now I put them both side by side and I tell people I've been with both names. But point being, she is was the senator, so you know, big deal at the time. And everybody else was surrounding her, interviewing and all this. So I saw what I call that girl off to the side, two handbags, not high heels, not low heels, pumped, black suit on. I was like, I bet that's Hillary's girl, her aide. And I went to her and got an interview. Point being to your point about mindset, that's inside, but also how are you able to strategize and like read a situation? Huh, everybody's going to this door. Why is that guy standing at that door by himself though? 
maybe the limousine of the celebrities coming there. You, you know, that kind of thing. So Does true. that make sense what I'm trying to bring out as well? I, I was in Sydney, Australia, and uh, I was there for the opening of one of the casinos uh, um, that they had over there. And mm -hmm. uh, they had a mile that, I mean, a, a line to get in the casino that was almost a mile long. It was unbelievable. Wow. And so I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh, shoot, I'm never going to get in here. I said, there's got to be another door. So I walked towards the back of the casino. There was nobody there. I opened the, the door and I walked right in. <laughs> but there's always got to be another way, right? And, and you are right that part of that mindset, and you see this all the time with entrepreneurs, the ones that have really made it is they're asking themselves better questions. One thing that you mentioned was tools that, you know, we do have more tools and more resources available to us. Uh, I did a presentation, uh, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, and I was talking about the increase in the amount of tools and technologies that are available to reach our targeted customers, the increase in the amount of books for how to build and grow a business, the increase mm -hmm. in the amount of pages on Google and courses and all that other stuff. We have more information, tools, and technologies than we've ever seen before. But now I got a pop quiz for you. Your chance of business success, your chance of actually succeeding, according to the U.S. government, how much do you think all those tools and technologies have had an impact in the last 20 years? Not sure the number, but I'm guessing it's had very little. I'm guessing. Because if it did, many people in so-called disadvantaged communities, meaning we'd all be billionaires, but clearly <laughs> there's something, forgetting the past, those issues, but today there's something with X percent of people's minds that are just different than the other, whatever, probably Tony said it, 90% or 80%. Did I pass the pop quiz or did I fail? You did, yeah, there you go, <laughs> right? But isn't that fascinating though? Yeah, sure. But let's look at, you know, there are different like groups of entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. You've got, you know, those who are just starting out that I kind of liken to, you know, a teenager, the teenager mm -hmm, sure. thinks that they're, in, that they're invincible and they know yeah. everything and they're always going for the latest and greatest stuff all the time. And, yep. you know, that's the young entrepreneur that says, I got a startup idea, but I'm telling you what, I'm going to go from nothing to $10 million within right. a year. And it's like, really? And they know everything, right? But they're jumping from one strategy to another, to another, to another. And then you've got the more seasoned entrepreneur. And the more seasoned entrepreneurs, like, look, everything works and nothing works. It, you know, whatever it is, I'm just going to commit to it and I'm going to see it all the way through. And I'm not egotistical enough to realize that I'm not going to make any mistakes along the way. So I'm going to make the mistakes. I'm also going to surround myself with people who have done it before and who are smarter than me and who can help to, you know, s s help me see the the forest through the trees, mm -hmm. like the, the whole bunch of, uh, you know, there's the, there's that little bit of a of a different response mm -hmm. and, and approach and. You know, even people today, uh, Elon Musk, um, uh, Richard Branson, and mm -hmm. so forth. You know, Richard Branson recently in an interview, uh, somebody asked him a question about failing. And he says, I failed the same amount today as I did, you know, back in the day. It's only now my failures are, you know, bigger. Yeah. But I still fail the same amount. But he's always surrounding himself with an entourage of individuals that can help mitigate that risk. So true. And I like that you said surrounding yourself because team is important. I mean, you can't, you know, there's one person, business owners and et cetera, but I think team is important to give you that feedback. And I think people, you know, failure, sometimes people hear the word failure and think it's like the startup. Oh, we just burned through $10 million. I don't think Charles and I are saying that to a degree, which is part of failure. But I think it's just, again, the mindset of that, let's experiment, let's try and learn from it. And as, yeah. as Dave Ramsey says, um, in his Southern accent, non-fatal failures. Um, so, you know, it's doing that as well. So I think you're, you're right on. And I've, man, I, I can't count the number of failures, you know, just even, even small ones, Charles, right? Like, just let me buy a domain name, throw up a landing page, because that's kind of my expertise, right? That's, that's, I'm in the information world. Throw up a landing page, do it, see if it happens. Oh, okay. No one bought it. I've been, I spent two weeks of time trying to do something. That's yeah. okay. So that's kind of the failures and that's counted because you learn from it and you try something. So now how much of celebrity or let me take that back. Uh, oh, I guess you would call it celebrity CEO because I'm thinking of, about your book, right? But uh, a strong personal brand, how much of that would you say has contributed to all your success? 
for me, everything, and I'll split this into two. Some people listening to us and some of the companies you probably work with and maybe some of your own uh, companies or things you're doing, Charles, personal brand may not be so relevant. Taking a, the, you know, whatever, the big pen company. What, at this day and age, nobody gives a darn who the founder is. Nobody cares. He or she don't have to run around. If they're even a company, they're probably owned by some conglomerate. But you know what I mean? Hey, yeah. I'm Mr. Big Pen. Buy my book. Get my podcast <laughs> called Big Pen. Clearly, that's not, you know, CPG products, right? Clorox. Nobody cares. You get my point. So there is a, there is a, a business to not worrying about personal brand. That's not for me. But I just want to acknowledge that. Sure. But to the point about personal brand, I think especially for smaller companies, there's something to be said that we can be our biggest asset. Yes, I have a team. I'm sure you do too. There's things I can do that are scalable. But for me, it's about me. I'm selling myself. Like yeah. many other influencers, thought leaders out there, Tony, to that degree too, is who you mentioned. Yeah. So I think, yeah. yes, from what I'm doing, uh, besides God's grace, man, it's been everything, you know, because I don't market it per se. Yes, I have Smart Hustle, which is a company. But generally speaking, um, Charles, it's Ramon. You know, when I think about uh, uh, Dell, I, I wanted to uh, interview Michael Dell. I'm still waiting for that interview. They said no. But then similar to Congress, they called me back, Ramon, you can't interview him, but could you open a new product launch with Michael Dell? So I'm with him in backstage. So it, it's all been that, that mojo. And, and the bottom line about the celebrity CEO concept, Charles, is that A, build a community of fans, and I know you know this well, and educate them to buy from you. So that's the personal branding side. Two, concept I often say, may not be for everybody, but it works for me, is ask for a smile before you ask for a sale. Before I try to sell a pen or a bottle of water, if it may be to Charles, let me just get Charles to know, like, and trust me, my friend, maybe you know John Jans, right? Duct Tape Marketing, he talks about those principles. Yeah. So let me get someone to know, like, and trust me, be excited about me. Um, be, then I have the right, I've earned the trust, the relationship, the credibility, then they'll buy for me. So that's the Ramon version of the celebrity CEO concept of ask for a mile before you ask for a sale, build a community of fans to sell for them. And yes, to your point, that's been my, uh, I think my success because many, I have many clients who come to me, uh, Charles and I, don't, and I don't even have the community that's a fit for their brand. If you follow what I mean, you know, yeah. metaphorically, hey Ramon, you know, we're building a water company in Pakistan. Could you, could we work with you? Mm, I know nothing about water. Or Pakistan, I'm teasing you metaphorically, but they're like, we still like what you're doing. So we just want you to do something for us. <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. So you just said, you know, build a community. So Ramon, you've got people here who uh, don't have a community. Okay. Uh, they're like, I love this idea. I mean, we're making money. I don't have a community or whatever. How do you build a community. Sure. One thing to acknowledge as, as another a person says a lot as Seth Godin says this, is that the community is already there. What we're doing, of course, is enabling them to rally around us. So the simple way of building a community, people may roll their eyes, but it is, especially today, I mean, 20 years ago or 40 years ago, you would fax, I guess, every day, fax to 10,000 <laughs> people. <laughs> but today, it's really the power of social media. And I'll say about five or six pillars of which one can build a community. Part of it's being known. I think that's part of it is that it may take three months, six months, a year, but just, oh, there's Charles. He's the guy known, I don't know, for, well, he's known for selling, so I'll keep it what he does. But you know, whatever you want to do, you're known <laughs> as the chapstick guy, the pen guy, the coffee guy, the teddy bear girl, whatever your thing is. But A, it's about producing that content. It, it is a content game to a large part, making people aware of who you are, the trust is being built. And over time, they're going to click like, they're going to sign up for email, they're going to listen to your podcast, they're going to read your book, they're going to attend your event, they're going to be in your webinar. So now they've not bought anything yet. Your list, in whichever way, Clubhouse, again, I'll take, doesn't matter the version, whatever you want to, you know, we can go detailed if you want, Charles, but for now, at the highest level, building some following. Now that you have their attention, now you can say, hey, by the way, if I can serve you, if I can help you with what I've been talking about, contact me here. That's the CTA call to action. I'm getting a bit granular here. And then that's how you make your money. But that's what I'd encourage executives and CEOs who are listening today who built successful companies. They're already doing. If you want to go to the next level, or maybe you're looking at building your legacy, or maybe you're looking at doing a, an add-on brand, the things I would say is, do you have a book or not? 
you have a podcast or not? Are you doing events or not? Bringing that local community or together or rallying around you. Are you doing some sort of regular content, a show in some way? Do you have a website? Not about the corporation, but vanity website. The Charles, you know, where he's smiling and doing something cool or <laughs> whatever it is, right? <laughs> so those are a few things and I can dive more into each, but the concept of that is, is are, are you feeding, educating, nurturing? And, and I must say the other thing, Charles, a bit of self-promotion. It may not be for every executive, but for those who get what I'm saying, part of it is saying, hey, everybody, yeah, I was featured on, yeah, I was, oh, and the other thing I forgot is publicity. So it's good also for you to be on, whether it's radio, TV, or other podcasts, to showcase your brand. Yeah. Well, uh, and it's funny, I know you used that example of like the big pen, right? But I find that when you're even studying some of the bigger uh, corporations, right, when Steve Jobs was, was alive, right, mm -hmm. it was Steve Jobs and Apple and mm -hmm people who resonated well with the Steve Jobs type of storyline really connected super right. strong with the Apple brand. Um, but even when they uh, were Apple, when it was not so much about the Steve Jobs story, they made a character and they created a personal brand around a character. Yes. I'm an Apple and he's a PC and they created almost like a brand around that. Right. And I do find that uh, there's this uh, saying, I don't remember who said it, that, you know, money flows where attention goes. Mm -hmm. And your company can only get so much attention. And that you can also get the attention. And I think the combination between two, we don't see an, an addition formula, we see a multiplication formula. Because like you said earlier, people do business with others they know, like, and trust. It's hard to much harder to know, like, and trust a company. It's a lot easier to know, like, and trust an individual. And Geico figured that out a long time ago. And it was, it doesn't even have to be a real individual. That's right. If, if you know, like, and trust, you know, a, a cartoon character, you're still going to end up generating that little bit of an edge. Disney figured that out with Mickey Mouse, right? It, everything is, is Mickey Mouse. Of course, they tell the Walt Disney story, but everything really is about Mickey Mouse. So there's something about creating that character, whether that's you, in most cases, it is going to be the CEO mm -hmm. versus the individual. But you said something else too, uh, Ramon, which is really important. And as I understand it, what you're saying is the number one most important strategy, and I'm being over general, and you might say, Charlie, you, you misinterpreted me. And, you know, that's okay, throw a shoe at me. <laughs> but as, as, as I understand, you're saying, Charlie, the most important strategy for building strong branding comes down to one word and that's content. Mm. I think that's one, one part that's important of, of course you have to know your target audience and who you're serving and all those things. I know, you know, but yes, content yeah. and, and people may poo hoo that because there's so much content out there, but for some reason, uh, Charles, I've just never a uh, clubhouse taking that example. I've been a clubhouse. It's been around for what a little over a year. There's a lot of rooms, a lot of channels, but people will gravitate to the room they're in. Podcast. Podcasts are a dime a dozen. But you have your people who like what you do in your niche yeah. market. So yes, I think that content in some way, whether it's event content, book content, funnel content, website content, or somehow, because we are consumers, are we not? Meaning this is what the human experience, besides our families and rocking a baby, which is touch, besides kissing a wife, in my case, you know, I'm do, doing that, whatever it may be, <laughs> you know, the rest of it for business, we're scrolling, we're reading, flipping Wall Street Journal, New York Times, wherever city you're from. So yeah, I think the content game is a big part of it because I, I'm trying to think how else then will Ramon or Charlie or Charles, you know, get, get, get out there. I don't think there's any now and, and to go back also, there's two ways you can buy advertising, which many of the companies listening probably have dabbled in or do Facebook ads, yeah. TV ads. That's still content. And, and going back to your point about people buy from people they like, why has the general, and I hope that's a good name, but the general, I think it's insurance hired Shaquille O'Neal. I don't know if he's in your market, but you know, dun, 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 the general they're buying their way. And actually, but I realize they have a little mascot, the guy with the big beard with that green hat. Yeah. And teaming a Shaquille. So my point, Geico, whatever the big brands are showing us, they just so happen to buy their way into influencers, Cardi B, whoever your choice is. We as a bit smaller companies, many of us, 
we are the CEO. And assuming you're a bit well-spoken, have a nice smile, you know, or an engaging character. All right. I think it's something to consider. Well, and there's another point that you brought up too, the importance of making sure you understand your audience and you're resonating well with them. And as you were talking, I, I thought of this metaphor. And, you know, when you think of movies, there are, you know, a million and a half actors and actresses and whatnot out there. And, you know, my wife will, if there's a particular actor or, or actress that is in a movie, instantly she's going to gravitate towards that movie. Oh, so-and-so is in that movie. I'm going to watch it. Meanwhile, that particular actor, actress is not, they're great at what they do, doesn't resonate with me. And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not that interested. So I'm going to choose a, you know, a different movie based on, you know, the actors, the actresses that, yes. that resonate with me. And that, that resonate, oftentimes it comes down to, you know, Raymond, you said it when we started this show that, you know, you watched a piece of content from my daily video uh, coaching videos that aligned well with your core beliefs, what you knew, you know, made sense for you. And you're and like, you as a person, I want to acknowledge that too, the content, but also you as a person for good or for bad, you clicked with me, but please continue. I just wanted to add that, that as well. That's, that's actually really important though. And, and so I'm going to add, I'm going to, increase on that. So that's important. So that's how you and I made that connection. But there are still plenty of people that may look at my content and be like, yeah, you know, he's not talking about growth hacks. Like I want a growth hack. I'm, you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to resonate well with that. That's right. And so, and so they, it's natural selection. They go the other way. Or, you know, I had, I told my kids the other day, I go, Hey, I had my first hater. I'm a celebrity now. And they go, what do you mean? I go, I had a, literally a person who wrote this huge, long post attacking my physical attributes. And, you know, back to mindset, I could have looked at that and been like, oh, man, like, <laughs> like that hurts. Like, yeah, right. It does. It does. And I was like, kids, I'm just like Kim Kardashian now. Like, woo! you know, I got my first celebrity hater you know, or my first hater. Right. Yeah. But, but, you know, there is that. Um, the the physical component and that yeah. comes down with the body language. Like when you meet somebody in a room, you know right off the bat before they open the mouth, I'm gonna like that person, right. or I'm not gonna like them. Right. And and even in content, I see a lot of people today who are hiding behind digital walls. If they're producing uh, YouTube videos, it might be everything. They'll just put their yes. their slides and they'll hide behind the slides. They won't show themselselves personally. Uh, yeah. On social media, they'll hide behind their tweets. They'll you know, they'll, they'll do something or create stock imagery or whatnot. And there you, as you said it so perfectly, like you're, you, that's only one part of the communication, but if you're not given the opportunity to connect with you on a very personal level, you're, you're holding yourself back. Yes. And I like the fact, Charles, that you were comfortable with that because that is a dimension of it. It doesn't, thankfully, it doesn't happen, I won't think, all the time, usually to smaller kids in school, playgrounds, people are bullied. But myself, most people in the world, Charles, like Ramon. I mean, I brush my teeth, <laughs> I do my hair, I'm a nice guy. Yeah. But there's been some people you've you had your first your hair. You do your hair, I see. I do, right? man. You do your hair. All right. <laughs> it takes a while, but I, I, I get it done. I got my hairdresser's actually over there, and you know they're going to come and uh, fix me up in a bit after this. But, <laughs> um, but, but, um, but yeah, people. But, but uh, a few times since I talk fast, sl not slurring my words, but I can I can get animated a bit and loud and all this. A few percentage of people, like one lady in particular, and even now when I say it. It does hurt. I mean, we want to say throw it off, but we're human. She was like, this is too much. It's too early. She just kind of, you know, tossed her hair, you know, and said it. So yeah. I understood it. Though. I get it. It wasn't a personal attack per se, but my approach, how Ramon is at that time at six in the morning, that wasn't her thing. She was like, you know, let me wake up. I haven't had my first coffee. So to your point, <clears throat> it's the content, but also as we're looking to build our personal brands, build our celebrity CEO style, be a bit comfortable that people may not like you. And I'll say one other thing, Charles, is that some things we could improve on, not things like physical attributes, but I have a friend of mine. He's, does verbose mean uh, you speak a lot? Is that what the word verbose means? Or speak too much. Or yes, like right. it, you define it too long. You just go on and on. And Thank on. you. Yeah. He's very verbose. And he's a good friend of mine, a mentor of mine, actually, from the UN day. For the, I hope he doesn't hear this well. If he does, it's okay. Point is, <laughs> very verbose. So that's something, though, he could work on with training. Yeah. how to speak in sound bites. And Oprah asks you, so do you have a black truck? Yes, I have a black truck. Truck, I like black trucks. Stop. 
he'll like 75 minutes. <laughs> yeah, right, so, right. You know, right. but my point is we can all do better on certain things. So if you're the CEO out there listening and you're not so well-spoken, you on the camera, you kind of sit like this. Those are things that your team can help you even just to prove a little bit and, and know to look at the lens, things yeah. like that. Well, how does a child start walking or baby start walking? Right. They just do it. And, and, and then they fall That's right. and they fall a lot. Right. <laughs> and I, I remember my very first podcast interview. I was so nervous. I almost canceled it. I was trying to think of a valid excuse where I could cancel and reschedule it because I didn't know what I was going to say. Um, I, 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 learn to to cope with it but i I have severe learning disabilities Mm. um doctor had said i had one of the worst cases she had ever seen before in her life i've got uh, every form of dyslexia that uh, and i would say every form i've got multiple multiple forms of dyslexia other than seeing things backwards i didn't know they came in other forms apparently they do yeah um uh word retrieval issues the whole deal and so you know when i start to get nervous that's when my my learning disabilities or some mm-hmm. call it differences or whatnot. I look at them as advantages mm-hmm. now, um, but that's when they really start to come out. And I'm afraid of being a bumbling idiot or looking bad or all this other stuff. And so, you know, that kind of held me back, but I, and for years, I actually didn't do the things I know that I should be doing mm. because they're, you know, I, like you said, I'm human. Um, you know, I didn't want to get on stage. I didn't want to do the podcast interviews. I didn't want to create videos. You know, I'm, I'm naturally don't do well on, on videos. It, but, I would never know. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, is that in the beginning, if you look at some of like my earlier stuff right. or, you know, I was terrible. Yes, we I, all were. <laughs> I, I mean, and I, I would record like a two minute video, but it would take me maybe, and I'm not even exaggerating, it would at least two hours. Wow. Because I okay. record it, not like it, record it, not like it, and record it, not like it, and whatnot. But then it was practice yeah. and repetition. Yes. And practice and repetition that now within a moment's notice, I can get on a podcast and my nerves don't even go up by 1%. Mm-hmm. Now it's just like yes. another phone call. Yes. Um, and don't you feel sorry then, Charlie, for the people who don't persist like you did, man. They're still stuck. And all, and, and all they needed was to keep doing it. But continue, I just, I just wanted to say to that person listening who, if you don't take the first step, can't yeah, hit. And, and, and you're right. And actually the one I feel sorriest for, believe it or not, is myself. Because I looked at how many years ah, yes, yes, that I didn't do that, but I looked at the impact of what it made. And it's funny because when I'm talking with other clients and uh, they're, they're saying, okay, so you know, here's some of the different things that you know, I could be doing and whatnot. And I ask them different questions they're like, well, why aren't you doing that? Mm. So, well, honestly, it's because I'm scared. Yes, and I said, yes. then that's what we're going to start with. And they're like, wait, wait a minute. Why do we have to start there? There's all these other things. And I said, because over the years, one of the things that I learned is that if there's something that scares you deep down, you know that that's actually what you should be doing right now. Wow. Wow. And so by, by starting to lean into that, you know, you start to make yourself uncomfortable. And, you know, there are different things that I've learned to make myself uncomfortable. Like, you know, when I, in the days I traveled with Tony Robbins, Tony would always say like, you know, do one thing that scares you or, um, you know, you want to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And one of the things that I've, that I've started doing as a routine is when I, when I take my shower in the morning, I start my shower on cold, as cold as it will come. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is actually, this, this was a, something that uh, a, a friend of mine, his name is uh, Josh, suggested that I do. And mm. so, but I, I, it made sense. It was a good idea. So I, I, I start the shower on cold mm. and I stand there every morning, like this morning, and I talk to my wife and I go, ah, oh, I want to get in the shower. It never gets easier. Right. And I'm like, I don't want to get in the shower. 
but I know I have to do it. Yes. And so I get, I step in the shower and the water is splashing at my feet and my legs are freezing. And I said, I can't turn that shower warm until I get my whole body underneath it. And so I eventually get my way in there and I, and I get soaking wet and then I'm able to turn it warm. But what I'm doing from an emotional and mental standpoint is I'm forcing myself to remain uncomfortable. I'm forcing myself to do the things that I don't want to do. And I'm starting my day that way. I'm starting my day doing the things that I don't want to do, being yes. uncomfortable and getting in a cold shower. Ramon, you know, I don't know what your experience is with this. For me, it's it hasn't gotten any easier. No, I agree. You know, <laughs> I agree. No, some things you just don't get used to. But I can see why I like you a lot, Charles. I mean, I don't maybe who knows what you see in somebody, but like the uh, whether it's dyslexia or something else. I, I my wife, I don't know if that's the same thing, but can you go get garlic? I come back with gender, ginger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> frequently i mean yes, she sends I me pictures she sends me now pictures of the images this is the type of cheese i want i i come back with it almost right but since i didn't read the text i just looked at the image but i thought it was orange <laughs> it was really blue i'm a hot mess uh church turned to song 946 ramon turns to 964 so, <laughs> i don't know but 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 to your point i think that's a common in many of us i guess who are dreamers thinkers were, were they, the part of us is the the mistake person like you mentioned you know but i think it's in, but i think it seems like the commonality we've learned to overcome our soul for it you in the hot shower it seems like the navy seal type of thing or special forces right the guy who got us on bin laden was something like i knew when i went up the stairs i was going to die um, so i said well let's go he didn't die but that was that i don't know if it's the same wavelength but that type of attitude it, it's what it takes yeah, and this comes back to what you started talking about earlier today, right? When we started the podcast, we started talking about mindset mm. and you special forces. What's the difference between special forces and everybody else? There are plenty of people that are more physically fit than yes. the special forces people. So it's not physical fitness. There are people with stronger athletic abilities, but they can't cut it in special forces it can, comes down to the mindset that's right when you look at ceos and you know those who have done really really well those are the people who are leaning in to those moments of being uncomfortable yes. um they're okay with being you know and, and i say uncomfortable i'm not saying like scared shitless Correct. right you know Correct. i get in the shower and i i stand against the wall and i let the, the water hit my feet for a little bit and then i make my way in there i don't just whip open the door and I'm like, here I come. And, you know, I jump in the shower and I'm like, ah! you know, because, you know, that's, I'm going too far into ex yeah, to an extreme yeah. and that becomes unsustainable, but, you know, being uncomfortable is sustainable. That's right. That's right. Right. But, you know, it's so, you know, I know we're pushing up against the clock and I know you're a super busy guy. So I got six know. more hours. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. Yeah. Hold on everybody. <laughs> um, but you know, when, we, when we're looking at like the concepts that we started talking about, uh, the concepts that you elaborate a lot more in your book, the celebrity sure. CEO about building that personal brand. When you build a personal brand, you are going to put yourself out there. Right. Building a personal brand is uncomfortable know right now that you are going to get haters you know just just know that right off the bat but also know tony robbins told me this as well uh you know i had said to him i just want people to like me and blah blah and he said go on the internet and do any search for my name you're going to see half the people hate me and he said i could tell you right now there isn't a single person out there that hasn't put themselves in a in a in a position of building a personal brand where they haven't been hated on. If you don't get hated on, you're not trying hard enough. Be grateful when you're getting hated on. Be grateful because that's starting to tell you that you're moving in the right direction, that you are trying harder. And the more I started thinking about it, I'm like, you know what? I mean, look, there are plenty of people that hate uh, Mother Teresa or that, you know, when she was alive, I hated Mother Teresa that hate the Dalai Lama yeah. that completely crap all over the Buddha, 
-hmm. or you know jesus christ or yeah. lots of hatred around that there's lots of hatred around you know some of the people that are historically revered as you know either the most holiest and also yes. the most the most hated mm -hmm. now on a from a more capitalistic you know viewpoint um howard stern was the most hated man on radio and also and the, the most successful <laughs> yeah the highest earner right the most successful like okay interesting the kardashians are hated on probably more than any other modern celebrity today and yet two of them are billionaires you know donald trump was the most hated candidate for president ever 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 yet he also had no political experience and made his way to becoming president of the United, St uh, United States, right? So it's like- And the biggest vote of half, you know, of course, President Biden won the election, but meaning whatever the numbers are, the biggest turnout or something of all time right? as well, so. Right, exactly. And so when you look at this, right, this is when Tony was saying, and I got it, when Tony was like, when you start getting haters, mm. you're doing things well. Now that doesn't mean, and I know that, you know, there's a gentleman I'm working with now that I'm trying to course correct because he incorrectly understood that. And so he's actively going out there to like, you know, hate and create yeah. haters, you know, where he's being- He's tipping over the trash cans and saying, hate me more, I'm tipping over your uh, trash yeah. cans. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, that, that's not what I mean. Like, yeah. don't actively go out there to like, don't actively yeah. just be a jerk. That yeah. is not the right way to do it. But when you're true to your core, when you pick a message, even if it's against popular belief and yes. you stick with it, you know, when you genuinely, and this is an important part, when you genuinely want to make an impact, a positive impact into somebody's life, you want to make a difference because for some people, they don't want the difference that you want to make, right? Right. Some people aren't willing to hear it or receive it or whatnot, right? But you're, you're going to create you know, some polarity and, and that's a good thing. No, you're so true, Charles. And I think that it, what's interesting on that point, I think is also that sometimes, sometimes people's opinions of you have all as well. Politics, maybe not so much, but you know, the, Ch Charles hated Ramon five years ago, but as he secretly started reading it or, or listening, he was like, you know what? I still don't like the guy's red shirt or something, but what he's saying, I'm too, I'm evolving my opinion. That happens sometimes too, you know? So, yeah. well, the more they see you, Right. Because the first time they see you, they might not like you. They won't know right. about you. Like, it's just going to be like, mm, I'm not sure. Right. But then through the laws of effective frequency, the more they start to see you over and over and over again. And usually it takes about 20 brand impressions that they go from Ramon. I'm not a little sure about this guy. Right. Yeah, like he smells he too much. I don't know. <laughs> you know, to all of a sudden, like, I can't wait to watch yes. another video and see that smile again. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like, so it does take it takes that effective frequency to get people from I don't know if I like you to yeah. oh you know I'll buy anything you're you, you put in front of me. That's right. So awesome, awesome. So um uh this is the Beyond Seven Figures podcast. And so as we wrap up today's episode, what would you say is the number one biggest piece of advice you can give to entrepreneur CEO that's looking to take their business beyond seven figures? Have, as you all have probably heard many times, I know two things have worked for me. Um, have your systems and processes dialed in. It's really hard to scale and get up if it's all in your head or you're making it up. I think that's one. And have people smarter than you on the team. I feel like crying as I say it, but Charles, that's been the biggest, oh, just over the past few years for me, I thought I had to be the smartest person. You talked about your abilities. I have my own, but man, I got some ninja people that can whoop my butt in various areas. I'm still the leader. I have to inspire the team. I got the best people, man. They can wrap rings around me and I love it. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. And it's so, so, so true. We all have our own unique ability, but our unique ability might be 4% of what we do throughout the day. And we're, we sometimes confuse that with what we're excellent at and excellent and unique ability are two different things. You can always find somebody who's better at what you're excellent at, but nobody can replace what that yes. unique ability is. Spend more time in your unique ability. And oftentimes that's what we see going from seven to eight, multiple of eight figures. Great Absolutely. piece of advice, Ramon. And Thank so you. we've, we got the book, the celebrity CEO, people can pick that up in every, you know, major book bookstore, right? 
And if somebody wants to learn more about you and watch some of your videos and absorb some of your content, be part of your community, where can they do that? And thanks for asking it. Uh, uh, smarthustle.com. Smarthustle.com is the best place. Or about me personally, Ramon Ray, R-A-M-O-N-R-A-Y.com. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Ramon, thank you very much for being a guest here on the Beyond Seven Figures podcast. This has been a lot, a lot of fun for me. Um, and so for all our guests listening, for more strategies on how to take your business beyond seven figures, please also visit us at predictableprofits.com. Again, that's predictableprofits.com. So this is Charles Cadet with my friend Ramon Ray, and I will see you in another episode.